My uh, title of my message for this All Saints Sunday is Living as Saints, Living as Saints. And the text is the Gospel reading from Luke chapter 6, verses 20 to 31. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> All Saints Day is a day to remember the departed saints, those who, relatives and friends who have left this world, gone on to be with God in heaven, talked with the kids about that. And so I couldn't help thinking about my Uncle Ole on this All Saints Day because earlier this year, his brother Nels passed away, my Uncle Nels. And there were three boys in Ole's family. Nels was the oldest, Ole was in the middle, and they had a younger brother named Canute. Now Nels stayed in Minnesota and farmed on the old home place, not too far from where Ole was living. But Canute had gone to New York, and he made millions selling those little rings that go on the top of shower curtains. He was the biggest shower curtain ring salesman in all of North America. Well, when Nels died, Ole had to track down Canute in Singapore, where he was looking for a new, new supplier. And Canute said, Ole, I am really sorry. There is no way that I can make it back for Nels's funeral. But I'll tell you what. I want to give Nels a, a first-class funeral. I want him to have the best of everything. You just get it all, plan it all, and then send me the bill, and I'll take care of it. Well, a couple of weeks later, Ole sent Canute a funeral bill for $18,000, and Canute just paid it. And then a week later, Ole sent Canute a note saying, I need another $200 for the funeral. <laughs> and Canute, Canute figured, well, some little expense must have come up, so um, must have been some little bill, so he wrote a check for $200, sent it to Ole. A week after that, Ole sent another note saying, I need another $200 for the funeral. And Canute thought that was strange, but he went ahead and wrote the check anyway. But then another week after that, he got another note from Ole saying he needed another $200 for the funeral. And finally, Canute thought, this is crazy. He picked up the phone and he, and he gave Ole a call. He said, Ole, what's going on? I keep getting these notes from you every week saying you need $200 for the funeral. What's the deal? Ole said, well, you told me to give Nels a first-class funeral, but he really didn't have any first-class clothes, so I rented him a tuxedo. <laughs> now think about that one, right? So Ole has been thinking about his brother Nels on this All Saints Day, figuring he must have looked pretty spiffy when he got to the pearly gates in that tux. But, but you know, remembering those who have died and gone to heaven is only part of what we do on All Saints Day. In the New Testament, the word saint is used in two different ways. Yes, it is used to talk about believers who are now in paradise, but just as often, the word saint is used to refer to the believers who are still in this world. The word that we translate saint in English is the Greek word hagios. The Latin word is, is sanctus, sanctus, and that's where we get our word saint from. But the Greek word in the New Testament is hagios, and that means, as I talk to the kids, set apart, set apart. A saint is someone who has been taken from this world and set apart into a special group of people known as the children of God. And how do we gain entry into this special set-apart group? We do it through faith. That's what the scriptures teach us. We become saints through faith. We all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes has faith in him should not perish but have eternal life. When you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins, when you believe that he rose again on the third day to save you from death, then you have the promise of everlasting life, and you are a saint. And heaven is a very real thing for you then, just as real as if you were already there, sitting under the shade of the tree on the bank of the river of life, watching the lion lay down with the lamb. So if you have faith, if you believe in Jesus as your Savior, you are a saint. And heaven is waiting for you. It's a done deal, as I said from the book of Daniel, forever, forever, and ever. The only one question that remains is this. How then should a saint live out his or her remaining days on this earth? How should we live out? Or knowing that heaven is coming, how does that affect how we live here on earth? If you are a saint and heaven is around the corner, 
How then should you spend the little bit of time that you have left in this world? Because really, our time in this world is very short. Most of our life is going to be in heaven. Martin Luther once said, when I wish to know how to live as a saint, I read the Sermon on the Mount. That might be why that gospel is uh, the gospel for this All Saints Day. It's a portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount from the Gospel of Luke. Now actually, it's not quite accurate. When we say Sermon on the Mount, we're usually talking about Matthew's version of the sermon. Matthew says Jesus sat on a mountainside and delivered the sermon. But in Luke's version of the sermon, which is what we have in our gospel today, it says Jesus came down from the mountainside, he had been on the mountainside, came down and delivered the sermon while standing on a level place. So whether it was the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Flat Spot, we don't know for sure. But what we do know for sure is what Luther knew, that this sermon is for us. It is for the saints. And when I look at this small part of the sermon, that is our gospel reading for today, I see three very important messages for the saints. First of all, I see a blessing. Second, I see a warning. And third, I see a command. So I want to look at those three things, see how they apply to our lives as saints. First of all, a blessing. Jesus said to his followers who were gathered around, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. Here Jesus identifies four things in this world that bring pain and suffering to the people of God. He mentions poverty, he mentions hunger, he mentions sorrow, and he mentions rejection by the world. Now you will notice that Jesus does not say that believers will not have to endure these things. What he says is, when these things are happening to you, you are still blessed. That's what he's saying. Why are you blessed? Because the pains of this life are only temporary. The day is coming when you will live in the kingdom of God, which is heaven. The day is coming when you will be filled with everything that you need and lack nothing. The day is coming when you will laugh because there will not be anything to be sad about anymore. The day is coming when you will receive a reward from Jesus for any abuse that you took because you were a, a Christian, a believer. And what this means is that when a saint suffers in this world, he or she never loses hope. We endure suffering with a strength that astounds unbelievers around us because we know that in heaven all of our suffering will be turned to joy. Now some time ago, Lisa and I went to a visitation for a... Um, a young man, 23-year-old young man whose family we know very well. He was killed in a car accident in St. Charles, Illinois. With, he was not drinking. He had his seatbelt on. He was driving too fast. And that really was probably what caused he lost control and hit a utility pole. And he and his friend who were with him both passed away. Now after waiting two hours in line, Lisa and I finally got up to where the family was. And there was sorrow and there was weeping. But as we hugged and as we cried with them, the young man's mother said, we know that God is good and he is going to give us the strength we need to get through this. And the father said, we're going to be okay. We had him in our lives for 23 years and we know that he loved Jesus. He was a wonderful Christian. He loved Jesus and we know we're going to see him again someday. In the midst of their pain and sorrow, they never lost sight of the fact that they were blessed by God and that their son was blessed by God. And I don't suspect they'll ever lose sight of that fact because they are saints. And saints know that in all circumstances, they are blessed. But then as, as soon as Jesus finishes talking about blessings, he immediately follows it up with a warning, a warning. And just as the blessing is meant for us, so too the warning is meant for us. Jesus says this, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Here Jesus identifies four things again 
that can cause a saint to turn away from God and lose sight of heaven. Those four things are wealth, physical pleasure, good fortune, and popularity. Every saint must be careful that we do not let the pursuit of those things pull us away from the will of God. You know, one of the most crucial aspects of our lives as saints is that we must have our eyes wide open when it comes to our own potential for sin. You know, in 1863, at the height of the Civil War, there were rumors floating around Washington that some government officials, maybe even some members of the White House staff, were not loyal to the Union. In fact, the rumors were that some people might have actually been spies passing on important information to the Confederate government. President Abraham Lincoln asked his Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, to investigate the rumors. And at the next meeting of the full cabinet, Stanton laid out all of the evidence he could find. And Lincoln was silent during the whole presentation. And when it was over, Stanton turned to him and said, now, Mr. President, what do you want us to do about this? And Lincoln looked around at the faces of his cabinet and he said, I was just thinking of a story I once heard about a farmer who had a very large shade tree towering over his house. It was huge, and it seemed to be perfect in every respect. It was tall and straight and magnificent, the grand old sentinel of the farm. Then one morning, the farmer was working in his garden, and he saw a squirrel run up the tree and run into a hole. And he got to thinking that maybe the tree was hollow. So he examined it closely, and to his surprise, he found that the trunk of the stately tree was indeed hollow from top to bottom. There was only a rim of solid wood left on the outside, barely enough to support the weight of the branches. So what was he to do? If he cut down the tree, it would surely damage other trees around it as it fell, and the house and the yard would lose their shade. But if he left it up, his house and his family would be in constant danger. One strong storm might bring it down crashing down on their house. So Lincoln looked then at Stanton and said, do you know what that farmer said to himself? And Stanton said, no, Mr. President, I don't. Lincoln said, the farmer sat down on his porch, put his head in his hands and said, I wish I had never seen that squirrel. (laughs) And that's exactly how Lincoln felt at that moment. There was a part of him who almost wished he had never seen the problem of the spies in his own administration because now that he had seen it, he was gonna have to deal with it. And dealing with it was gonna be painful. Well, people, that's the way it is for the saints of God. We cannot sit and pretend that we don't see the sin inside of us. We have to see it. And we have to know that we are infected by original sin. By our nature, uh, we are corrupt and sinful, hollow. And it is only by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, that our sins are forgiven, that we are justified in his sight. But we are still sinners because we're still human. Martin Luther says we are simul justus et peccator. It's a Latin phrase that means we are at the same time justified by God and sinners. We are forgiven of our sins by faith, But as long as we are on this earth, we are influenced by the pull of sinful desires. And the warning is this. Do not let the sinful desires of this world pull you away from God. The way to stay connected to God is through daily prayer, daily repentance. Wake up every morning and commit yourself to doing the will of God. Every night before you go to bed, ask God's forgiveness for the failures of that day. Heed the warning of Jesus. Take an honest look at your life every day. Pray that God will give you the strength to stay close to him, the strength to not be led astray by the corrupting influences of the world. And then finally, after the blessings and the warnings of the text, Jesus issues a command to all of his saints. Here's the command. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. From one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. This is a stunning, almost impossible command. Jesus tells us, his saints, 
not just to love those who are lovable, not just to love those who love us back. Jesus tells us to love even our enemies, to love those who hate us, who curse us, who abuse us. And most importantly, he says, don't ever seek revenge. Revenge is not the way of the believer. Now, I know those are difficult words to hear in a world filled with political strife and religious persecution and terrorist attacks and almost continuous warfare going on around the world. Some people say, is Jesus saying we should never defend ourselves against those who seek to do us harm? Should we always just accept what, uh, whatever people do to us without ever striking back? There are some Christians who read these verses and come away with that very conclusion. They believe all Christians should be pacifists. We should never defend ourselves against attacks to our person or property. We should never participate in any kind of action that involves confrontation or force. We should never be, the, a pacifist would say, Christians should never be police officers or soldiers because of the likelihood you would have to use force. But here is where Martin Luther's understanding of these verses is very helpful. Luther spoke of a theological idea drawn from the scriptures that he called the doctrine of the two kingdoms, the two kingdoms. He understood the Bible was teaching us there are two kingdoms which operate side by side in this world. On the right hand is what he calls, this is my right hand, is what he calls the kingdom of Christ. On the left hand is what he calls the kingdom of the world or sometimes the kingdom of government. And God is at work in both of these kingdoms. Through the kingdom of government on the left hand, God brings order and protection to a nation. And it is through the government that God administers justice in the world, that God punishes evildoers. Luther would say it is acceptable for our government to engage in police action or military action to pursue and punish those who attack the, the individual citizens of a country or, or the country as a whole. In fact, Luther would argue it is the duty of government to bring people to justice. But when it comes to the actions of individual Christians, we operate in a different kingdom. The kingdom of Christ is the kingdom of the gospel. And the gospel forbids private revenge. Where the kingdom of the government is ruled by the law of justice, the kingdom of Christ is ruled by the law of love. And the law of love is the law God expect, expects his saints to live by in their individual lives. God does not command governments to live by the law of love. That's not their job. But he does command us, the followers of Jesus, to live by the law of love. That is our job. By loving our enemies, literally giving the shirt off our back to a stranger in need, we in introduce the, them to the love of Jesus Christ. The reason that we, the saints, operate under a different law than that of the government is because we have a different purpose. The government's purpose is to keep order. It uses the rule of law. But our purpose is to win souls for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Every enemy is a potential ally <laughs> if we can win them to the kingdom of Christ. And for that purpose, Jesus says, I want you to use the golden rule in your individual life as a Christian. As you wish others would do to you, do so to them. Or the more common way that we hear it said, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. People, this business of being saints in the world is not easy. Becoming a saint is very easy. All it takes is faith. Jesus did all the work of saving you. But living as a saint can be tough. To live as a saint is to remember that you are blessed even when you're in the midst of suffering. To live as a saint is to fight against sin and temptation every day so that the world does not lure us away from God. To live as a saint is to love others even if they curse you and take advantage of you. But to live as, as a saint is also to know the greatest truth of God's word, and that truth is you have a rock-solid promise from God that because of what Jesus did for you, you're going to live forever in heaven. And that, knowing that, is what it really means to live as a saint. Amen and amen.